Hello, everyone. I just want to welcome you to today's webinar, which is hosted by the Georgetown's Office of Planned Giving and the Georgetown University Alumni Association. Thank you for joining us for what is Georgetown's first ever estate planning webinar. It's estate planning and opportunities in uncertain times with Bridget McInerney Harris. My name is Mindy Siebenauer Bopp, and I'm the Executive Director of Plan Giving for the University, and I'll be facilitating today's program. Before we get started, I'd just like to share a few tips and reminders. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available on our YouTube channel within 48 hours. You'll also receive a link to the recording in a follow-up email. Um, and then Bridget will answer a few questions at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to send in any questions using the question section of the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, and if you're having any technical difficulties or other issues, feel free to submit those concerns via the questions uh, section as well, and someone from Georgetown will assist. Um, so it's now my pleasure to introduce Bridget Harris. She earned her undergraduate degree from the School of Foreign Service, as well as a law degree from Georgetown Law, and she's also a Georgetown parent. Bridget is a partner with Jeffer, Mangles, Butler, and Mitchell in the firm San Francisco office. She represents individual clients in estate planning, gift planning, trust funding, trust administration, and executive planning. She advises clients on a variety of trusts, including revocable and living trusts, trust for children, irrevocable life insurance trusts, qualified domestic trusts, grant, retain, grant or retained annuity trusts, and charitable trusts. She also represents business owners in corporate and, and tax planning, uh, business transition planning, and wealth transfer. A significant portion of her practice includes the formation of limited partnerships, limited liability companies, and corporations. Bridget assists clients in real estate transactions, including the purchase, sale, and exchange of property. In addition, she advises clients with respect to family loans in real estate and business transactions. Bridget is certified by the California State Bar Board of Legal Specialization as a specialist in estate planning, trust, and probate law. Uh, without further ado, I'm pleased to turn things over to Bridget. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is well wherever they are. Um, we're, I'm in San Francisco, so we are still sheltering in place, so I'll be presenting from home in case you see distractions in the background. This webinar is an overview of estate planning, um, and also it will provide some planning techniques that can be used in the current environment. Originally, this seminar was formatted for John Carroll Weekend in Bermuda, which of course was canceled. So we're now trying to quickly give you the same information in a much abbreviated format. So I apologize that I'm galloping along on this presentation. As always, please consult your own estate planning attorney because all the states have different nuances with, estate, with respect to estate planning and estate and inheritance gifts. Currently, under federal law, every individual can, um, let me just, here we go. Um, under, under current law, every individual can transfer during life or at death the amount of $11,580,000. You can use some of it as gifts during your life with the balance at death. Right now, that amount is adjusted annually, so it should go up each year. What we're looking at, though, is we know it'll sunset in 2026, meaning automatically without any kind of legislation, that $11 million will drop down to $5 million indexed for inflation. In addition, we're also concerned that because of the environment today, especially with this incredible federal debt that we're incurring, as well as the possibility that the administration changes, we could see that exemption being reduced at a much faster rate, possibly as early as 2021. So as we tell most of our clients, please don't delay doing any planning, thinking that you've got till 2026, because I think that could change. The basic documents that every individual really should have in, in, is a will, and or a revocable trust, a power of attorney for both health and a power of attorney for financial management. And then the individual should coordinate their retirement assets so that they go along with their estate plan. Going back to the will or the revocable trust, we use in California revocable trust because probate is so difficult and cumbersome. 
Some states have a much more abbreviated probate process, so it's not as difficult, and you may want to use a will. A will or a trust, a living trust, accomplishes the same thing. The benefit of a living trust is, is there's several benefits, one of which is that um, the trust is very private. When an individual dies, the administration of the trust is completely private. There's no court involvement. Nothing is public. In addition, with a living trust, if something happens to you in that you're incapacitated, the living trust will take over, the trustee continues managing your assets, and you do not need a conservatorship. So quick review on what a revocable living trust is. It's a document that says, during my life, I transfer all of my assets, other than retirement assets, I transfer them to the living trust. So the living trust now holds or owns those assets. So if an individual dies, the trust continues. It's like a corporation, it's an entity. It doesn't change. Therefore, the trust administration continues. There's no requirement to go to court. The next or the successor trustee who's managing the assets takes over. So in a typical husband and wife situation, you might have husband and wife as the trustee managing their living trust. You use your social security number. Nobody cares that you actually have a trust. But if one spouse dies or, is in, or becomes incapacitated, then the other spouse takes over, continuing ma the management of the trust assets, again, without any court involvement. Upon death, the same thing. One spouse dies, the successor trustee is the other spouse, and they start managing the assets. If both spouses die, then you have a third party or a relative or a corporate fiduciary doing the management of those assets. A will simply says, when I die, I want my assets distributed as follows. In order to have that will executed, you need to present the will to the court in the jurisdiction where the decedent resided. And then the court basically administers the will and gives the directions or orders to the executor to administer the, the assets and eventually distribute those assets. It is, it is not private. Anybody could look at the court documents. Um, for some people, that doesn't make a difference, so they'd rather use a will. The cost between a will and a revocable trust used to be significant, maybe 20 years ago. For most, for most estate planning attorneys, the cost is almost identical, whether you do a will or a living trust. The next document that is important is a power of attorney for financial management. And it's called different things in, in different states. But in essence, it's, in essence, it says, if I am incapacitated, then I want this person to make financial decisions for me. They can only make the decisions on my benefit, but they're the ones that will be signing checks or filing tax returns or transferring assets to my trust. So that, that power of attorney is, is very important because many times we find somebody has gets in an accident, goes into the hospital, and, and this document allows that person who's designated as the attorney in fact to make those decisions and, and, and do any financial uh, arrangements that are required. The document can be, it's called durable, and that means even if you're incapacitated, the document is still valid. Upon death, a power of attorney for financial management becomes void. So it is only effective while the individual is alive. Similar to the power of attorney for financial management, there's also a power of attorney for health. It's called different things, as I said before, in different states. California, we call it the advanced health care advanced healthcare directive. Some states call it a living will. Um, other states call it the Declaration of Health. But what that document says is, if I'm unconscious or unable to make medical decisions, then I want this person to make my, those decisions for me. The document also, in, in general, covers if I die, I want to be cremated or buried. If I die, I want organ donation. I want uh, pain medication. I don't want pain medication. So the document covers all of the medical decisions that may, might arise if the individual becomes incapacitated. The next thing is um, looking at your retirement assets. And many people feel that the retirement assets will follow whatever their will or their trust says. But unlike 
a, an asset that you own individually. Retirement assets, those assets in an IRA, 401k, a SEP plan, those assets are, are subject to the contract between either the employer or the financial um, company and the individual. So your IRA is like a contract, and that contract has a form called a beneficiary designation form. Might be one page, might be online, might be a paragraph, but it says, when I die, I want the assets remaining in my retirement account to go as follows. And many people do not coordinate that beneficiary designation form with their actual estate planning documents. Um, everyone jokes about when clients come in and they have, they're married, they have children and they're leaving their assets to their spouse or their children. And then you look at the retirement assets and the beneficiary designation form might say, I leave all my IRA to my mother. So you always want to update those forms and, and make sure that they're coordinating with your estate plan. I'll get into the beneficiaries that you should designate a little bit later because that's covered in the SECURE Act. Finally, you should also review the character and title of your assets. So again, depending on the states where you live, your property could be titled as your separate property, could be titled as your community property, could be joint tenancy with right of survivorship, could be tenant in common, could be, um, or, or if you have a living trust, you want those assets titled in the name of your living trust. So it's, it's a good idea to pull up deeds, to look at your investment accounts and actually see how those accounts are titled. Like retirement accounts, life insurance is also a separate asset. It's a contract between you and the life insurance company. And again, like a, lot, a retirement account, there's a beneficiary designation form, and that beneficiary designation form controls. It, go, it's, it supersedes whatever you might say in your estate plan. So your estate plan could leave everything to your family, while your life insurance, the beneficiary could be someone else. So you always want to coordinate that life insurance um, beneficiary with your estate plan. In general, most life insurance policies will have their like their trust as their beneficiary or their spouse as their beneficiary. Usually they if ch children are minors, they don't put children as the beneficiary because because of the custodianship issues. Um, in addition, in this current estate plan, which we're going to start talking about right now, there's a lot of techniques that you can use aside from the basic documents. So going back to what I said, everyone should have a will or a trust, a power of attorney for health care, power of attorney for financial management, and then check title to all your assets and also check the beneficiary designation form on your retirement accounts. Above that, then there's some more sophisticated planning techniques. And in this environment right now, those techniques uh, could be quite valuable. We've got refinancing or, or entering into family loans. We have sales to, and, and this is a hard one, IDGTs, which are intentionally defective grantor trusts. Doesn't sound good, but they're actually very good. We also have GRATS, grantor retained annuity trusts, and we have CLATS, which are charitable um, lead annuity trusts. Uh, as you know, that we love all these little acronyms. Um, so let's talk about a QPERT, and that's a Qualified Personal Residence Trust. And I'm kind of going to go off the slide here just to make this simple because we are keeping trying to keep on time. A Qualified Personal Residence Trust only applies to your residence or a vacation home. And what this trust says is, I, the owner of the property, am going to transfer my house into a residence trust and my, the beneficiaries of that trust will be my, let's say my children, but they don't get it for 15 or 20 years. So I'm transferring a $500,000 residence and my children will be the beneficiaries of that in 20 years. So that gift is clearly not worth 500,000 because they're not getting it for 20 years. So that ha the value of the gift is discounted based on the term of years of the trust, which and the trust could be five years, 10 years, 20 years. In addition, you throw in my age, and the IRS looks at my age and says, okay, if you're 20, most likely you're gonna survive the 20 year term. 
If you're 80, it's very unlikely you're going to survive the 20 year term. So that the age of the owner of the residence will also affect the gift. At the end of the term of the trust, the house reverts to the ownership of the children. In the meantime, during that 20 year period, it's my house. I pay the property tax, I pay the insurance, I live in it, I can do whatever I want with it. So we've set these trusts up in California over the last 30 years. And, and at, at least in you know some of the areas of California, houses have appreciated significantly. So if you transferred a house for 500,000 20 years ago, and at the end of 20 years, the house is now being transferred to the kids, the value of that house today could be two, two million. But the value when I made the gift 20 years previously was only maybe 250,000. The other one aside, which most clients ask about is, well, what if I want to sell the house? What if I want to move to Hawaii? What if I want to do something else? The, the Qualified Personal Residence Trust does allow the flexibility to sell the residence, move on to another one. Um, there are a lot of options in setting one of these up. Again, the, the, it can only apply to a, your primary residence or your vacation home. It does not apply to rental properties. Um, the next one that I want to talk about is a grantor retained annuity trust. Very similar in concept to the qualified personal residence trust in that I'm transferring an asset into a trust and I'm picking a term of year. So let's say I pick 10 years and I say every year for 10 years, I put in a million dollars into a grantor retained annuity trust for 10 years. Every year for 10 years, I get back $100,000. So in essence, I'm putting in a million, but I'm over 10 years, I'm going to get a million back. So what you're doing is you're transferring the appreciation to the children. So at the end of 10 years, if those assets have appreciated, the children or the beneficiaries get the benefit of those assets. You do have to add a slight um, interest rate to that payment each year. So you get 10% back plus, let's say 0.5% back as far as the interest, so that you get a piece of the interest rate back. What's wonderful, what's very exciting right now about grantor retained annuity trust is that the interest rate is so low and that's called the threshold rate. You know, years before the threshold rate was like 10%. Now the threshold rate is almost 1%. So it's very easy to look at it and say, well, over 10 years, I, I expect these assets will appreciate significantly more than this threshold rate. So using a grantor retained annuity trust is a very, very effective tool in today's economy. And you're, you're making a transfer or a gift, but you're getting back the principle of that asset. So you really, you are only gifting the appreciation. Um, Zero out grats, it's a term, we all use this term, it just means I'm transferring enough, I'm transferring the asset and I'm getting enough back so that there is zero benefit, there's zero tax. Um, and the only thing that the beneficiary gets is whatever is in excess of the current interest rate environment, the appreciation. There's a lot of nuances with grats, um, which we like to do if and that's called siloing a grant, a grant. And it, as an example, I would set up three grants. I would transfer my environment or my um, energy assets to one grant. I transfer my health assets to another. I might transfer real estate assets to the third. So I silo it. So if the health industry takes off and appreciates significantly, my beneficiaries get the benefit of that. If the energy assets De depreciate and they don't go anywhere, it's okay. I get my assets back, no harm, no foul, I get them back. So you silo that the depreciation goes in one direction, the appreciation goes to your ben your beneficiary. I've had some clients that set up, you know, seven or eight grats each year, just harvesting the appreciation that just keeps going tax-free to the next generation. Um, we talked about life insurance previously. So there's ways to hold life insurance. You can go and get a policy, whether it's a whole term, whole life or a term policy. 
And the beneficiary of that policy could be your family, your spouse, anyone else that you want. Um, and you own the policy. You can change the, the beneficiaries at any time. You make the premium payment. If you die, those proceeds come back into your estate and they are subject to estate tax. If your estate is below the threshold amount, whether it's 11 million or 5 million, it doesn't matter. If your estate could be in excess of that threshold amount, the exemption amount, then you may want to have the life insurance proceed or life insurance policy owned by someone other than yourself so that the proceeds are not included in your estate. And what we generally, we set up a life insurance trust and that trust holds the, holds the life insurance policy. When you die, the proceeds come into the irrevocable life insurance trust and they're not subject to your estate tax. There are rules on this in that you really have to stay far away from the trust. You can't be the trustee of the trust. You can't write a check to New York Life for the premium, you have to first make a gift to the life insurance trust, and then the trustee makes uh, pays the premium. So there are there are rules that you have to follow, but they're actually pretty straightforward and easy, and um, it does keep all of the proceeds out of your taxable estate. Um, let's see, okay, the, right now well, why we're recommending that clients keep their life insurance, again, is what I said before, we're concerned that this $11 million exemption, will, it will be reduced to $5 million in 2026, but it could even be reduced lower. Some of the candidates have espoused that they'd rather have an exemption amount in the million or $2 million range. So if that's the case, that means anything in excess of a $1 million would be subject to the 40% estate tax. Do you, you don't want to add to your $1 million or your $2 million, your life insurance proceeds. So you would keep them in an irrevocable life insurance trust, the same beneficiaries as your estate. They could be for your spouse. They could be for your children. But you've excluded those assets from your taxable estate. So the proceeds will not be subject to the 40% tax. Another reason that we like life insurance is, is to equalize gifts. So you might have a family-owned company, and the, and one child is the daughter runs the company, and it's a uh, you know a retail establishment. She's running the company, and your other two children are not involved at all. Well, if that's your largest asset of your estate, and you die, you don't necessarily want to divide the company into three shares when two children are not even involved in the company. So you can always use life insurance to equalize your gift. The daughter gets the company, the other two children get proceeds from a life insurance policy. Another technique that's being really used uh, in this environment is uh, uh, interfam an interfamily loan. So an interfamily loan is, I, my, one of my kids wants to buy a home and I want to loan them the funds as a down payment, possibly loan them the funds to buy the property. If, possible and you're living in the right state. Um, but that loan traditionally, in order to make sure that that loan is not treated as a gift, you actually have to enter into a, the child has to sign a promissory note promising to pay back those funds. So if you go to a traditional bank, the interest rate may be 4%, 5%, could be as high as 6 or 7%. But if your family is loaning you the money, they want to make sure it's at a very reasonable rate. But you have to pick a rate that the IRS doesn't get involved in saying that rate is so low, this is really a gift, and we're going to treat it as a taxable gift. So the IRS established rates called AFRs, Applicable Federal Rate, and those rates change every month. And those rates right now, um, I just looked it up this morning, the, the rate on the three-year loan is 0.18%. The rate on a nine a, a, a loan that's less than nine percent is less than one percent right now. So these you could set up a loan with a with your child for five like a five year loan and you'd be charging about one percent interest rate. So it's like a gift. They're getting this loan. It's it, they're able to buy a house and that loan is not treated as a taxable gift. 
Another benefit is the interest rate is not being paid to a bank, it's actually being paid back to the family. This is a little bit more complicated. This is called an intentionally defective grantor trust. And um, trying to make this as simple as possible, you set up a trust. It's an irrevocable trust. The children might be the beneficiaries of this trust. It's called defective in that all of the income inside that trust is treated as my income. So I set up the trust. I transfer a million dollars to the trust. The trust generates 50,000 in income and dividends. That 50,000 is treated as though it's my income. I have to put it on my 1040 and pay income tax on it. But the 50,000 stays in the intentionally defective grantor trust. So you're supercharging this gift. They not only get the asset, but they don't even have to pay income tax on the income generated in that trust. You continue to pay the income tax. You can always turn off that switch if the tax gets too big, but while, while it's a defective trust, you're paying the income tax. The second part of the trust is if you die, it is still treated as a completed gift. So that asset is not in your estate. So in, in you know, in San Francisco and California, we've been setting up these intentionally defective grantor trusts. We're putting pre-IPO assets or we're putting assets that we believe will appreciate substantially. May be part of a company that's going to get acquired. It may be a company that's just starting off. We see that it's going to grow quickly or that it, it or that there might be a public offering. You put the asset into the trust at a very low, you know, a dollar a share. It goes public and it's now thirty dollars a share. The capital gains on that on the one dollar a share up to one hundred dollars a share is I pay that tax. So the beneficiaries of the trust get not only the principal but they're not even paying the tax. You always have to walk through clients with this to make sure they're not giving too much in case the asset really explodes and they're paying more tax than they actually that they can than they can afford. The other two trusts are a charitable remainder trust and a charitable lead trust. Very much like the term says, a charitable remainder trust means I'm transferring an asset into a trust. The beneficiaries right now are my children or my spouse, and they get it, they get the income or an annuity amount for 10 years. And then at the end of that 10 year period, the re remainder, whatever's left in the trust, will pass to a, a qualified charitable. The charitable lead trust is just the opposite. You set up a trust, the charity is the beneficiary for a term of years. At the end of those terms of year, then the the um, beneficiaries would be your your spouse or your children. There's different reasons why you set up one more than the other. Is the asset appreciating tremendously, or is the asset already appreciated? So those those will determine whether you want to do a CRT or a CLT. In addition, you look at the interest rate. Um, if the interest rate is really low, you what you you're going to pick one trust. If the interest rate is really high, you will probably pick another trust. Okay, um, let's jump to the SECURE Act, which was actually, I think, the main topic that we were supposed to talk about at John Carroll Weekend. So the SECURE Act was passed pre-COVID, um, January 1, 2020. And some of the big changes in this act deal with retirement assets. So the biggest change is that um, when an individual has a retirement account, at a certain age, they must take distributions out of that account. And that's called the required minimum distribution. You can always take more out, but you have to take the minimum amount. So the IRS established the age that it's 70 and a half. By 70 and a half, you have to start taking the distributions out. Well, a lot of studies were done that, that people are working past the age of 70, uh, 70 or 70 and a half, and they didn't want to start taking distributions out, which would just be added to their taxable income. Remember, everything that's coming out of your 401k or your IRA, once you take a distribution, is subject to ordinary income tax. 
So the SECURE Act pushed back that age of uh, the required minimum distribution age from 70 and a half to age 72, which is, is a big deal um, because clients now are pushing back to the age of 72. Even if they're retired, um, they'd like to, they, they want to push it back. And on this, the, the CARES Act, which I'll talk about later, this comes into play again. Um, it also eliminates the age for making traditional IRA contributions. Let me go back. Um, previously, under the old law, you could you had to stop making IRA contributions at that 70 and a half. Now you can continue making contributions. You still have to have earned income. You can't be retired. But if you're earning any income at all, you can continue to make IRA contributions. Um, it also expands the ability for uh, spousal IRA contributions, even if the spouse is not working. Another definition or another expansion on this retirement account is the definition of compensation. Before compensation was very limited, um, you know, basically you're up, you're W-2. So there were certain industries such as um, fellowships or TAs that, that were getting stipends and they didn't qualify for an IRA or a Roth contribution. That definition has expanded so that they will be treated, that, that their stipend will be treated as compensation, thereby allowing them to make a contribution to an IRA. A lot of these fellowships, they don't provide 401ks, so now they're at least able to shelter some of that income with an IRA contribution. The law changed too in that you can withdraw a small amount of your uh, uh, retirement account for, um, oops, excuse me, uh, you can retry, withdraw a small amount for adoption or birth expenses. Um, if you withdrew any amount before the age of 59 and a half, you had a 10% penalty on top of the taxable income. Now the distribution will not be subject to the with the 10% tax if it's used, if it's used for, uh, birth or adoption expenses. There's a cap on this of, um, there's a cap on this of $5,000. Uh, the SECURE Act also did something for estate planning attorneys, which we've been using or eliminated a technique which we've been using for quite a while. And that is the stretch IRA. And what that meant was when when I set up an IRA and I designate, let's say my children as beneficiaries and my kids are in their 20s and I die, they were able to roll over that their IRA distribution into their own inherited IRA and then they could defer distributions over their life expectancy. So they, if they're 20, their life expectancy might be 80. So they could take distributions over 60 year period which allowed them to defer the gain and defer the income tax over that 60 year period. It was a great estate planning technique. So, but traditionally an IRA or a 401k is for the benefit of the employee and the employee's spouse. So Congress decided there's no reason why we're trying to allow this for, or give this benefit to, to children. It should only be for the surviving spouse. So what they've, they've changed that stretch IRA rule. So you can't leave an IRA or you can't leave your retirement account to your, your child and let them stretch it out over their life expectancy. They've now shortened the term for a stretch IRA to 10 years. So if you leave an IRA to a child, then, the, then they must withdraw all of the funds over a 10 year period and pay income tax in their tax bracket. Still is it still is beneficial, but it it has it has el not eliminated, but it's reduced the benefit. There are some exceptions to that stretch. Obviously, surviving spouse you can give it to the surviving spouse, and they get the benefit of this of a long term payout. If you have minor children, you can leave it to minor children, which I don't advise because then you have to set up a custodian account. But or a disabled individual. If, if an individual is disabled, they're still entitled to the stretch rules. This is not retroactive. So if any of you are the beneficiary of a stretch IRA, you can continue to be the beneficiary of that IRA. It's not a retro, retroactive um, 
piece of legislation. So um, what are the opportunities under that January 1, 2020 Act? And the benefits, of course, you can continue to make IRA contributions. You have more time to do a Roth conversion now. Um, always check your plan beneficiaries. And there is, um, as the qualified QCD, that's a qualified charitable distribution. You still can make qualified charitable distributions. And that means, let's say you're, you're 72 or you're 73 and you are still working and you don't want this distribution and it's required. Remember I called it a required, an RMD, required minimum distribution. Well, you don't need the money. You're going to put it in your income and all you're going to do is pay 50% tax on it. So instead, that required minimum distribution can go to a charity, and that's a qualified charitable distribution. You transfer the funds to charity, and you do not pay any income tax on that distribution. So that is still going on under the SECURE Act. Um, as we all know, we're in the COVID experience right now. And in 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 this environment, in March of in March of twenty uh, March twenty seventh, twenty twenty, Congress passed the CARES Act, and and what that act did was one, it allowed recovery rebates of up to twelve hundred dollars for taxpayers, and that meant if you filed a tax return and you had a certain limited income, you were going to get an automatic twelve hundred dollar check. I think it's even signed by um, our president. And you, if you're a married couple, you get 2,400. In addition, there were in, uh, the real benefits on the enhanced uh, charitable contributions. Um, some of the benefits are that if you itemize your deductions, the 60% limit on AGI, adjusted uh, gross income, was eliminated. You can you can make a contribution up to 100% of your adjusted gross income. This is just under this CARES, CARES Act for a limited period of time. In addition, if you don't itemize, because um, you still can make get a charitable deduction of up to $300 for any cash contributions or cash equivalents, like a check that you make to a charity, to a charity. We also made change, they also made changes to the net operating loss modifications. The 80% rule was lifted, and the another benefit is that your net operating losses can be carried back for five years. So you can amend your returns up to five years and claim those NOLs. Um, another benefit, which is the uh, 100. You can you can withdraw from your retirement account up to a hundred thousand dollars under limited circumstances, and those circumstances are if you can show not that you actually have to uh, you know file a return showing it, but if you can if you have and or will have evidence that you have a coronavirus related issue. In other words, your income is less, you actually got it, a family member got it, um, there's a, a you know, list of criteria. If, if you meet any of those criteria, you can take a withdrawal of the $100,000. You will, you will not pay the 10% penalty tax on it. Um, you will prorate that $100,000 over a three-year period into your taxable income. So you still have to pay tax. I mean, every withdrawal out of a retirement account is subject to income tax. But you can you can defer that tax over, you can pay in increments over three years. You also can then repay it. So if you take the $100,000 out because you need it or less than that, let's say 50,000, you take it out, you're gonna pay tax on it. If in year three, you're, you're back to where you were, your economy is back, you're, you know, you're still making money, you can then repay that money, amend the prior returns where you had to pay income tax on it, and then the tax is eliminated because you put the money back into the account. You have a three-year period to do that. Um, the, uh, it also extends, the CARES Act also extends the un unemployment period. CARES Act also allowed, previously under 401ks, you could take, you could borrow funds out of the 401k 
up to 50,000. They've extended that to 100,000 under limited circumstances. In addition, back to um, the SECURES Act on your required minimum distributions, when you, when you hit 72 or, and you have to take these required minimum distributions out, or if you've been taking them out for the last couple of years, you're now taking them out in a period where the, your, your, your portfolio could have significantly decreased. So you really don't want to take funds out of your portfolio when the markets drop. So under the CARES Act, they've eliminated the required minimum distribution for this year. If you don't want to take it, you can let you can let it ride. You can keep it, you keep your funds invested. If you've already taken it out, so if you've already taken it out in you know January through today, you you can't put it back in again. You've already taken it out. But if you haven't taken your required minimum distribution out, then you can wait until until next year when it kicks back in and you have to take it. You can also still do the qualified charitable distribution. If instead of taking it, you can also you still can make a distribution to charity and it will not be treated as a tax as in your taxable income. Um, all right, I think I've I've galloped along on this. Um, Mindy, do we have any questions that I might be able to answer? We do, Bridget. So I'm going to go ahead and start at the first one. Um, I'm just going to read it out to you. I am, I am, I'm in my 70s and recently retired. I have funds in several 403B plans. When I die, will any of the funds left in my plans be taxed by the IRS? And how do these accounts um, relate to the $11.5 uh, million dollar exemption? So retirement accounts are taxable when you die, but they your exemption quali I mean covers them. So if we if you died today and there was eleven million dollar eleven eleven million five hundred eighty thousand dollar exemption, and you had um, two million in your account, that two million is subject to income tax, but not estate tax. If you had twelve million or thirteen million in your retirement account. It's going to be that excess over 11 million will be subject to estate tax. All of it's subject to income tax. But um, right now, you, uh, you know, as I said, right now you don't have to take any withdrawals. But also remember that exemption is going to drop. We know the exemption is dropping to five million. Um, so even though I keep referring to 11 million five hundred eighty thousand dollars, it will drop in 2026. I think it will drop in 2021 or or soon or before 2026. Bridget, I just wanted to um, mention that uh, if you're planning to include charities in your estate planning, making um, those gifts out of your IRAs can, can sometimes be really tax advantageous, um, and you know obviously helps with the exemption as well. Absolutely. So as Mindy said. When when you have a when you have a retirement account, so we'll take a million dollar IRA, and that when that million dollar IRA, and let's say you say I leave fifty percent to my two kids, your two kids are going to take the fifty percent, and when they get that fifty percent, they're going to pay income tax on it in their taxable bracket. Then if you're in your will or your trust, you said I leave a hundred thousand dollars to a charity such as Georgetown University, that charity most likely will get it. Of course, they get it without paying any estate tax because it's a charity. But if you had reversed that and said, in my IRA, I'm leaving $100,000 to Georgetown University, and I'm leaving $100,000 to my two kids in my will or my trust, your two children receive it tax-free. There's no estate tax on it. There's no income tax on it. And the corollary is, when the charity receives the $100,000 out of your IRA, they pay no income tax. So it's far more, it's much more beneficial if you name charities in your retirement account versus in, let's say, well, you could do both, but versus your will or your trust. The other thing to note on naming a charity in your, with, with an IRA uh, is that you, it's very difficult to name a, to give a dollar amount to the charity in the IRA. Most financial institutions want you to leave a percent. So you would have to say, I'm leaving 50% of my IRA to the charity um, or 20% and then the balance somewhere else. 
And, and the reason for that is the financial institution doesn't want to take responsibility if, in fact, you say, I leave $100,000 to my charity and the balance to my children, and you start with a million, but by the time you die, there's only 50,000 left. They don't want that possible litigation issue. So they require that you actually do a percent. But as Mindy said, that percent passes to the charity completely income tax free. So it's it's more it's more um, tax efficient to name ch uh, charities as the beneficiary of your retirement accounts. And I highly advise it. Any <laughs> other questions? Yep. So Bridget, if you create a revocable living trust, do you need to retire all of your assets, including your house and investment accounts, in the name of the trust, even if you and your spouse are co-owners of the asset? So this is kind of a duo question in that um, if you live back east, you're in separate property states and you each will have your own trust. If you're in the western states, you have community property, you're going to have a joint trust. I'll, I'll quickly go through both. Yes, you want to title all of the assets uh, into the name of the trust, or you kind of, you know, you 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 eliminate the benefit of having the trust. If you set up a living trust but you do not fund it, and funding means transferring the assets into the trust, the title. So your house says John and Betty. Now it's transferred to John and Betty's trust, and the trust owns it. If you do not do that and you die, then we have to take the house and any other assets. We have to use your will, go to court and say they really wanted it in their trust. So now court, would you order it, probate court, order it that it be transferred into the trust. So you are still going through probate. So if you don't transfer it to the trust, you're going to have to probate those assets to get them into the trust. So that's why titling is important. Previously, I mean, when I first started in practicing estate planning, no one did the trust funding. We'd give the client the trust document, they'd sign it, we'd say, here it is, by the way, here's the instructions, go fund the trust yourself. And eventually they died and nobody funded anything and we were still doing probate. So now what we recommend is when you set up your trust and you come in to sign it, you are also signing the deed that transfers it into the trust. You're you're, you're signing all the account information that set up the trust. Remember, you're still using your own social security number. The IRS doesn't care you have this trust. There's no transfer tax when you transfer it into the trust. It's just a um, administrative action that really is necessary to make sure it's done well. On the eastern states, it's going to be two trusts. So the husband and the wife will each have their own trust and they will transfer their assets into the trust. Um, California and the Western states, a little bit easier. If one spouse works and the other one doesn't, it's still treated as owned as 50-50. In, in the Eastern states, it's a little bit different, um, which your estate planning attorney can advise you on, but still you would set up two separate trusts, for one for each individual, and you would get the assets into those trusts. Uh, next question, can you name yourself as the beneficiary of a charitable remainder trust? Well, you've eliminated the benefit of that. Um, we do we do set up charitable remainder trust naming a spouse as beneficiary remainder to, to the charity. Uh, can you make IRA contributions at after 72 if you are self-employed or only if you are a W-2 employee? No, no, if you're having income, you need income. And they've defined the, the definition of income. So if you're filing, if you file your 1040 with, and you have income, self-employment income, that still qualifies. Great. Um, for 2020, is the RMD requirement suspended due to the coronavirus? Absolutely. So um, so they, they, the CARES Act, that corona, Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Relief Act was enacted to counteract all the stock market crash, the loss of jobs, all of those things that happened. So it, it, it passed at the end of March. And the at that point, we're looking at the stock market, you know, tanking, and they didn't want to require you to take out a distribution, pay income tax on it when the market was so low. 
Okay. Uh, next question. I am legally married, but if I die, I want everything to go to my children and not to my spouse, including my retirement funds. Is that possible? Okay, with not you can do that with your assets. So if I died, I could leave my 50% of my assets to a third party. I could leave it to my children. I do not have to leave it to my spouse. But retirement assets are different because they're, they are considered, um, they could be, your spouse has a right to those assets. So you, you, in order to name a third party, including a child, as the beneficiary of, if I wanted to name my kids as the beneficiary of my IRA, I would have, to, when I fill out that beneficiary designation form that I talked about, I would have to have my spouse sign it. So my spouse would have to be aware that I am changing my beneficiary to a third party. Okay. Uh, after death, for tax purposes, are my assets treated differently in the hands of a trust versus the hands of a human? Um, well, okay. Um, when you die and you have assets, and, there, and they, you had to pay estate tax or you were within the exemption, those assets get a step up in basis. Meaning if I bought my house for $100 and now it's worth a million dollars, the new tax basis of my home is a million dollars. If the beneficiary sells that house, they will pay no per million because that's the fair market value. They will not pay any income tax capital gains on that asset. That applies whether the beneficiary is a trust or the beneficiary is my is an individual. When I die and I leave my and I have my assets in trust, my trust document will say, "When I die, these assets are to be distributed to my children when they attain the age of 25. If they already are 25, then the distribution goes immediately outright to the child. It's the exact same as if you had named the child in a will. So the trust acts exactly the same. The child's already 25, the child gets the asset. But if the child's only 18, then it does act differently. The trustee will keep that asset in trust, manage it, give and, and still pay for the benefit of the child, anything the child needs, health, education, camp, whatever they want, but then at the age of 25, the trust will terminate and distribute the asset out. I hope that answers the question. Uh, if, if someone has taken advantage of the gift tax by making gifts to children uh, 20 years or so ago, are they still entitled to make additional gifts above the original granted amount to the $11.5 million threshold as long as that new exemption is in effect? Yes, you are. So if the exemption was two million before and you you made a gift to two million, you now still have nine million left to go. Um, so you always have that whatever the exemption amount is at the moment of your death or while you're alive, you can use it. There's also no th no such thing as <clears throat> a clawback. Clawback means I made a gift today of ten million dollars to my ch my children. Five years from now, the exemption drops down to two million. They can't claw back that gift and subject, and then I die in, in five or six years. They can't claw that back so because at my the date of my death, the exemption now was only two million. So you, if you use it, great. You can use the new exemption, add more gift. Um, but you and and any gifts made up to that eleven million dollar threshold will not be clawed back if when you die the exemption is reduced again great uh what are the repercussions of appointing non-us citizens as your trustees and beneficiaries so um appointing non let's first do the non-benefit non-us uh, beneficiary if you're appointing someone that is a citizen of another country and not a citizen of the us because if you're a citizen of the us and you reside in another country that's fine so that beneficiary may be subject to inheritance tax in their country. So we can leave our, again, back to our 11,580,000, I can leave that to anyone, 
So if I leave it to four people that reside in another country, that's fine. But if that country imposes an inheritance tax, which is different than an estate tax, an inheritance tax is a tax on the beneficiary. So if I receive money, I'm taxed on that receipt. So it depends on each country. So you would have to really look up the law of each country where that beneficiary resides. With respect to naming a trustee or an executor who is a non-resident, non-citizen of the United States, there are significant dif difficulties and problems. That's all, I mean, it really takes um, an act of God. You're gonna have to have court approval. There's a lot of problems because the United States is very concerned that money is gonna go out that should have tax should have been paid on or state tax should have been paid. So we recommend that if if you really want a trustee in another country, at least, a, at least appoint a local trustee or a corporate fiduciary and initially to handle all the trust administration work. Okay. Um, and that's a, one other thing on a will, I should have mentioned this, where I said the will and the trust are about the same, a will is the one document necessary to appoint guardians. So if you have minor children, you, you absolutely have to have a will and that will will then appoint a guardian. And along that line, although your will nominates a guardian to take care of your minor children, that guardianship is has to be blessed by the court. It's just your nomination. Now the court has to bless it. And appointing non-resident, non-US citizens as guardians is very time consuming and very difficult. And you're, you, there's a very large gap between the time of your death and when the court finally approves a non-resident as a guardian or non-citizen as a guardian. So in that same situation, we absolutely recommend that you designate an interim guardian that is a US citizen that in the United States that can, can take physical control of the child. Right. Um, how do I choose an executor or trustee? So um, the executor is in charge of the will and the trustee is in charge of the trust. Both, both individuals or, or the person you pick can be an individual that you respect or it can be a corporate individual. It could be a corporate fiduciary, a bank could be it, or you know, uh, or a professional fiduciary. The executor should have a very small job because the executor is just running this through probate. Um, the trustee could have a job that lasts for, for decades. You could set up a trust saying, when I die, I leave my assets to my children until they're age 30 or 35, and your children are two and three. So the person you pick as the alternate, your backup, because you're the original trustee, the person you pick up as your backup could have a job for 30 plus years. So you want that person to be very financially responsible. They're not necessarily the person that's gonna be watching your kids, but they're the person that's gonna be managing your assets. Um, so most people think, well, I have to pick my child. I have to pick my, you know, and go by all this, go oldest to youngest, um, but you do not. You can't, what you're looking for is the person who's most responsible. And that person can be a corporate fiduciary. It could be your accountant. Um, it could be, uh, you know, your financial advisor. You really want the person to be res res fiscally responsible. It could also be your spouse. And most spouses really want to be the backup so maybe you pick a spouse and they're co-trustees or co-executors with someone that you feel will be more organized. All right, so I think we have time for one more question. Uh, so when making gifts from your estate, is the federal exemption reduced from the bottom up or from the top down? <laughs> it's reduced from the bottom up. So you make an 11, I mean, let's say you make a $1 million gift. Um, you well, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. You used up one million of your eleven million five hundred eighty thousand dollar exemption. If that exemption is you still remaining on death, you're probably going to pay no estate tax. Is that the, I'm not sure if that's the question. Your the rates start immediately at forty percent once your lifetime gifts or gifts at death exceed the eleven million five hundred eighty thousand. Okay, perfect.
Thank you, Bridget. I just want to thank you for sharing your expertise with the Georgetown community. And thank you to welcome. everyone. Thank you to everyone who also joined us today and took part in the program. We're in the process of revising our estate planning guide, which is a free resource intended to assist in putting together your estate plans. Um, please look for our follow-up emails, which will include uh, a feedback survey, a link to today's recording, and the option to request the estate planning guide. There were also a lot of questions about whether they could, um, uh, whether the the presentation will be available. Yes, um, that link will also be in there. And then uh, whether or not the slides would be available. If you're interested in that, please note, please uh, complete the feedback survey and just put a note in there. Um, if you have any questions about today's material or questions about Georgetown um, and including Georgetown in your plans, feel free to reach us to the Office of Plan Giving. Our email is plangiving at georgetown.edu or visit the website. Thank you all again for joining us.